Well, thank you for watching all the big car videos in 2022. I hope you've enjoyed them. I thought it might be interesting to do a countdown from the least popular video to the most popular video. It doesn't include the Trabant video that just came out. That's released too recently, so it wouldn't really work in the charts. Anyway, do you agree with the order of these videos? Should some of them have done better? Should some of them have done worse? What was your favorite video? Let me know in the comments about uh, what you feel about the video order. Anyway, uh, the links to all the videos for 2022 are in the description if you want to see them in case you've missed them or forgotten them or whatever. Anyway, on with the show. How could a video about the size of parking spaces fail? It's a mystery. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to know the government size of a parking space is 2.4 meters by 4.8 meters. Anyway, nobody wants to see this video. In this video, I strove to find out whether three-wheelers are dangerous or not. Short answer, they're not, but nobody cared. Nobody drives three-wheelers, probably because they're dangerous or they think they're dangerous. Anyway, if you want to watch more car videos that people don't like, like the history of Dunlop, the history of turbos, disappearing car doors and windscreen wipers, I've got loads of videos about things like that on my second channel, Little Car. This is my first video about an Australian car, or is it a Japanese car? I mean, it's basically a rebadged Honda, like the Rover 200 over in the UK. I thought people would want to hear the history about the Rover SD1 smaller cousin. And it's an interesting delve into the fallout of the demise of British Leyland in the 1970s and 80s and the fallout in Australia in particular and what uh, British Leyland in Australia tried to do to deal with this demise. I sort of knew this video wasn't going to do well because my original video about the Ford Sync didn't do well either, but it was always a video I wanted to do because it's something I could provide a unique take on as I was part of fixing the whole problem. In short, Ford ordered an in-car entertainment system. It was slow, it crashed a lot, it used flash, which was a really bad idea. They built the new Ford Edge car basically around it, so they had no backup plan when they found that the thing was slow and crashed and didn't work, so they still had to release the car anyway, so chaos ensued, and as I say, I was part of the team that fixed it. The video did okay, but it's not about a car, and apparently you like to watch videos that are about cars and not in-car entertainment systems, so point noted. Going on to videos about cars, apparently the Renault Scenic is one of your least favourite cars to watch a video about. Maybe it's because MPVs are boring, but it's a story of Renault finding their feet and told with great bits by Patrick Le Quemon, who was uh, Renault's head of design. So I thought it came out really well, but there you go. It maybe, it maybe isn't the most interesting car for people to watch. What's less boring than MPVs? Well, crossovers, of course. But the Nissan Qashqai is something that is, seems quite rare today. It's a British success story. The Nissan design team in the UK were going from duds like the Nissan Almera Tino, which was a Renault Scenic competitor, to the Qashqai, which sold really, really well. And again, it's told expertly by someone who was there at the time, it's general manager David Tuhig, who was very kind to take the time to tell us more about the history of this wonderful car. Well, this was one of the community polls that I did and the community spoke and said they wanted a video about Subaru. So I did a history about Subaru and Subaru of course is more than the WRX. It's got a rich history for many decades making many amazing cars. 
Subaru today is a powerhouse with stratospheric growth, certainly in North America in the past 10 years. And maybe that's thanks to the Toyota minority stake that they made about 15 years ago. Much has been said about the Audi Quattro, but relatively little about its poor relation, the Audi Coupe. The closest relative to the Coupe today is the A5, but Coupes today are under attack by crossovers like the Nissan Qashqai, and the remaining Coupes are being electrified. The Audi Coupe is a beautiful design from when Coupes were cool. Yes, yes, I know, I need to make part two of this video that covered just the 70s and 80s, and part two that covers the 90s and beyond will be coming in 2023, I promise. <laughs> um, Ford today is an embattled car company, and the end of Focus and Fiesta shows it's in real trouble. The RS brand comes from a time when every other car on the road was a Ford, and they could get extra cash with bonus models like RS models. They need to sell a lot more cars today though for RS to come back in a meaningful way and it's, that's a really sad state of affairs. In the West, the Hyundai Pony is seen as a cheap, crummy car, but as far as Koreans go, this is where it all began for Hyundai. The video is really about how Hyundai got started on their road to success and with British people helping to produce it and managed by the man who brought the Morris Marina to the market. Is it just more than a marina in disguise? Well, go back and look at the video if you want to learn more about exactly how the genesis of the Hyundai Pony came about. Well, this is a recent video and it's already moved up several places while I've been making this video, so it may move up more places in the chart over time. But uh, the Red 05 video has done pretty well and uh, that's, that's very nice to see. The comments I get from you on my videos are usually pretty down about EVs and about how they're taking over the world, but generally people were pretty upbeat about the new Renault 5 concept and people thought it was generally pretty cool. So it looks like it's going to do well, which of course means that's the kiss of death and it'll do absolutely terribly. Well, the Fiat Numero Uno was only Numero 14 in videos this year, but it's a phenomenal design from Giugetto Di Giaro that Fiat rightly realized would have been wasted as just a Lancia and so of course they turned it into a Fiat. And it's also the start of Fiat fixing their rust problems. And so maybe that's why this is the most popular Fiat of all time ever made of any particular model. So will it come back reimagined like so many cars have? Well, that's unlikely as the Panda and the 500 names are already being used and already doing really, really well. So why would Fiat make another small car? Well, apparently you like the Fiat 126 a little bit more than the Fiat Uno. It certainly got a lot of love in Poland where it was about the only car available for a certain amount of time. And yes, I did say that this was the only rear engine car still produced. I was aware of the 911, but I thought of it as a mid-engined car, but as you all told me, I was wrong. Sorry, I make mistakes. So the Fiat 126 was a wonderfully tiny practical car and cars like the Smart 4.2 now try for this small car city practicality, but Fiat had it all sorted in the 70s with the 126. Talking about the Smart car, this is the 12th most popular video and sent me down a whole deep dive, different path, trying to understand how the whole Swatch brand came about, which is interesting in its own right. And I talk more about it in the Smart optional extra video if you're interested in hearing the whole backstory about that. And it's pretty interesting. But Smart was Mercedes, essentially it was Mercedes wanting to break away from luxury cars. They were trying everything in the 1990s. They tried to make the A-Class and cars like that. The Smart 
sold okay. It didn't sell brilliantly and it wasn't bad enough to kill it off. So they just kept producing it. And of course it helped Mercedes with their environmental credentials because all their big luxury cars weren't particularly environmentally friendly. So since Mercedes now have smaller cars and Swatch really isn't doing very well, they've got rid of their problem child and they've sold it to Chinese company Geely who will probably use it as a Trojan horse to enter the European and maybe even the North American market as well and could really do pretty well for them. Knocking on the door to the top 10, it's everybody's favorite roadster. And when I make videos, some of the cars I spend so much time looking at get me so excited. I start scouring the used cars websites to see if I can buy one. And of course this was one of them. Um, if, you're, if I was gonna have my choice, I would like to get a Mark III with an electric roof, but eh, lethargy. I, I move on to something else and then there's some new shiny thing and uh, it's too much trouble, so of course I didn't bother. But when the MX-5 was proposed in the 80s, only 2,000 roadsters were sold in the US every year. And if you look at the market at that time, you would think, it would be a terrible idea to make a roadster. But this is an example of someone having a vision and following it. It's sort of, if you build it, he will come, sort of quote from Field of Dreams. The MX-5 was a car built by car geeks, basically sitting around in a bar saying, you know what I'd like to drive? I'd like to drive this car. And I think all credit to them, they pushed it through and of course they were right because there were so many other people around the world who felt the same way. So in the future, it's gonna be interesting to see how the MX-5 does in this EV future because they may have to do a lot of changes to the MX-5 to make it electric, but it's a low volume sports car so they've got a very limited development budget. So it'd be interesting to see just what happens about small sports cars as we go to electrify everything. At number 10, the Tin Snail. An amazing, simple piece of engineering, and I love amazing, simple pieces of engineering. It, the, the mechanics were so good, they were designed in the 1930s, but they were still being used for new cars in the 1960s. The 2CV influenced another car, which I can't believe I missed. It was, of course, the Citroen C3. The 2CV is such a simple car that when Emile Leray cracked the chassis of his 2CV and bent the steering column in the Moroccan desert, he reconfigured it, he took the whole thing apart and used the shell as a tent for, for sleeping at night, turned the whole thing into a motorcycle and escaped. There's not many cars you can say that you can do that with. I love Art Deco and the Chrysler Crossfire was a new styling direction from a resurgent Chrysler. But this video is more about the Daimler Chrysler disaster and all the after effects. Just like Mercedes wanted to branch out with the Smart and the A-Class in the 1990s, they wanted Chrysler as a volume car maker in North America where they didn't really have much of a presence, certainly in the small car market. And this was part of Mercedes' plan for world domination. Of course, it just went crashing down. It was a complete disaster. And the Chrysler Crossfire was caught in the crossfire of this complete unmitigated disaster. The Ford car is a bit like the Capri. Both of them took an existing platform and plopped a new body on it and then both sold on their looks and of course both faded away as customers went for something more shiny, new and fashionable. Ford tried to make it into their mini Fiesta, sort of like a VW up, something sort of smaller than the Fiesta and their, their new brand for that. But the Ford car, certainly the second generation in the late 2000s, shows that Ford was losing its touch. They didn't have their finger on the pulse to make successful cars that they could sell, most importantly, for a profit. And then we come to the Fiesta, another car that went the same way as the Ford car 10 years or so later. 
What the Fiesta and the car show is how Ford has lost its mojo, its ability to make a hit car. But you can still buy a Fiesta today. Unfortunately, it's for an eye-watering £20,000 starting price. Maybe Ford has decided that they didn't want to lose money on each one any longer, so they just put it for whatever price they're making it for, plus a little bit more. Yes, I know that Brits say Daimler, not Daimler. Well, I do now that you've made it very clear in the comments. I'm very sorry, I said it wrong. Uh, it's clear from the ownership of the Daimler, Daimler name. It's so messed up that it'll be hard for either owner, either Mercedes or Tata, to do anything meaningful with it. It would probably be best for Mercedes just to buy the rights outright from Tata, because Tata are not really going to use it. They can only sell Daimler Daimler cars in what was the British Empire regions. And, for, and, it, and the name certainly still has a lot of value. And realistically, the people who are going to use it are Mercedes, because Mercedes and Daimler, Daimler, they, the names are just intrinsically linked and will be forever, really. Okay, we're getting to the sharp end now. The fifth most popular video of 2022 is all the times that Ford tried to reboot the Capri and basically didn't. So Steve Saxty, as you know, makes these wonderful books about all the f unknown Ford concepts, and he's done them for the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but he hasn't done anything for the 2000s and beyond. And so this is the first time some of these photographs have been seen outside of Ford, and I should say a big thank you to Steve for letting me show them to you. As I've said, coupes seem to have had their day, but the Ford Capri name is so important, particularly in the UK, that maybe the name will return in the future. I find it amusing that American automakers' attempt to limit Japanese imports actually led to Toyota building the Lexus that ate away at their luxury sales as well. It sort of completely backfired on them. The Lexus brand has gone on to be a success, but not a runaway success. In the early days, we thought it was just going to sink BMW and Mercedes, but BMW and Mercedes have fought back and now they sell a little bit better than Lexus. That's not to say Lexus as a brand has done badly, it's done really, really well. But the same can't be said for the LS Saloon, which really doesn't sell very many cars at all now. Although it's not selling well today, um, it didn't mean it was not the right car to lead with in 1989. It was absolutely the right car to lead with. It was going up against BMWs and Mercedes large saloons, which were the cars to have in, at that time. And obviously it was a car that you wanted to hear more about. The Scottish horror story that was the Hillman it was your third favorite video. And what a story it is. It was the car that arguably led Root to sell to Chrysler. It was the wrong car, delivered too late, which didn't work properly, and made by people who were being told by union leaders to demand the world, and they, they would get it. No wonder it failed, but it's a lesson that we can all learn from. Finally, I just love how Prince Philip here just didn't seem to know where he was or what he was trying to open at the time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to declare this, whatever it is, open. <laughs> Press the button. <laughs> The Hindustan Ambassador is a story of a newly independent India trying to find its feet. The East India Company was an outside entity that invested in India and eventually took it over. So a new India didn't want the same thing, so they strictly limited outside investment. And this was epitomized by the ambassador and it severely limited Indian growth. Many today in India see the ambassador as a symbol of the bad old days. But the ambassador, originally the Morris Oxford, also showed the abilities of post-war British designers to build a tough, reliable car. And so, on to your favourite video of 2022. 
why hasn't Mitsubishi done better as a car company? It's a question I've asked for a long time and it seems I wasn't alone. Sorry if I didn't mention your favourite Mitsubishi in the video, there are a lot of different models and maybe that was part of their downfall, they just made too many cars and didn't focus on one particular thing. In the comments some people didn't agree with my claim that Mitsubishi had failed, but Mitsubishi had all the advantages of Honda and Toyota, yet they're now just a subsidiary of Nissan and don't design their own cars so it's hard to see Mitsubishi as a, anything other than a failure, it's certainly hard to see them as a success. Anyway, thanks so much for watching Big Car Videos in 2022, if you missed any of them there are links to each of the videos in the description. Let me know which one was your favourite and what sorts of videos you want to see more of in the future. A very happy new year for you for 2023 and I'll see you in the next video.